You know, tonight we have in the room um, nine organizations and agencies that we feel are partners in every way with the cause that we want to each be a part of. And there's not a spirit of competition here. It's not a us and them, that one over the other, but rather just the heart of abundance, that we believe that you have something to do and that you need a partner to do it with. And so tonight, I just want to encourage you. You're going to hear from some of them tonight. Not all of them are on the stage or we would have a huge stage. And so um, just take time after we're done here to, to step out to the tables and really get to visit and get to connect with that organization, that agency that you feel best meets your needs, your family need, is going to come alongside you in your journey. That's what it's going to really be about. Uh, the other thing I just want to say is that there are several in the room who are here because you have an interest to foster or to adopt. And we're going to talk a lot about that. And you are, some of you are in the room because you have an interest in supporting those families and individuals in that journey. And I think it's important for you to hear what's said tonight because you want to understand as you become part of supporting what exactly are they going through? What does this look like? What, what are they, what are they, what's happening in their lives and in their homes? And so I feel you're going to benefit a lot from the information shared. And at the end, I'm going to ask those of you who are interested in supporting to stay in the room and those of you who are interested in moving forward in a foster to adopt process to go out and get started meeting some of those agencies. Let me introduce a few of my friends tonight, and they really are friends. I've gotten to know many of them quite well over the last month. This is Glenna Bilberry, and she's with the Bear Foundation. This is Keith Howard. He's with Arrow. Uh, Lenore Espinosa is with CPS and she's their faith-based recruiter so we've gotten to work a lot. She helps come alongside and get churches like us to get involved. Erin um, is with us today. She's from Lutheran so Social Services. There she is. <laughs> I got you all over, the, all over the page. This is Peggy and she's with CASA. This is Angela. She's with the Texas Boys Ranch. And on the end is Mike and he's with Benchmark Family Services. Also tonight we have Kaylee and Megan from Buckner. You ladies want to stand up? They're right there in the back. Mary Lauren Taylor and a, a group of people from the Children's Home. Good. Uh, Paige is here, and she's with the CPS Rainbow Room. So Paige has a lot of amazing... For those of you who want to support, you're going to want to talk to Paige before you leave because she's got some amazing things to share with you. And then Dana is also here from MCH Family Outreach and her um, team, too. Thank you. Thank you all for being, there, being here. Can you all give them a round of applause? Okay, so with that, let's get started. Glenn, I want you to start us off and tell us a, a little bit about what the general requirements are for fostering and adopting. I'm so glad all of you are here. We just thank you for the opportunity for all of our agencies to be represented with the Heart Gallery this last month. It has been a wonderful outpouring of love and from each of you to welcome us, as well as information that uh, people have picked up because it's, it's not, there's nothing better than the church reaching out to help the children. So thank you for that. So some of the general requirements to become a foster parent or a foster adopt parent are guided by the minimum standards that the Texas Department of Family and Protective Services puts out. So if you think about it, it's a big book of all these rules and it's minimum standards. So a lot of times each agency will require a few additional things because we want to be better than minimum. We want the best for these kids that are coming into care. But you must be 21 years old, you can be single, you can be married, your home must pass fire and health inspections, you must have a background check and FBI fingerprints completed. And that's for anyone over the age of 14 in your home. Physical assessment will come out and, and check your home, making sure it's a safe place for children. TB test for all the ones that live in the home. Home study, where we come out and ask you lots of questions. And then if you think about it, paperwork. Not just a little, but a lot. Because it's all important that we ensure that we can show that your home is a safe place, a good place for these children who have been taken from their homes because of neglect or abuse. Once the paperwork's completed, then you get your license, and then the fun part begins. Placement of a child, which could happen within 24 hours or it could take a few days. Some people are surprised. The next day? Yeah, it happens. Mm -hmm. It happens. To foster a child, you must have the child in your home for six months before you can consummate the adoption. So the fostering to adopt, you go through all of the process, same thing to become a foster family, and then once the child's parental rights are terminate, terminated and they've been in your home six months, then we can, you know, the adoption can be consummated. 
If you're looking at a child off of Heart Gallery or the TEAR uh, website, you have to be a fo verified foster parent before you can um, take a child because we have to turn in your home study for selection process. That gets you started, but as each agency may have different things that you have to do to be uh, a licensed home, you'd need to check with each, each one of them. Thank you. You know, as, for as long as that process sounds like it is and what it would take, I've been really pleasantly surprised. We had a family the very first week we showed, we had the Heart Gallery with us, that contacted Glenna, actually, and began the process. And she was just telling me before we came in tonight that they're almost wrapped up. Now, that's probably record-breaking time because I, was, I understand that this family is, like, passionately pursuing what they believe God's called them to do. But I share that to the rest of you to say, I think from what I've learned, you're going to drive the process. How fast do you want to get things done? It's really going to be a lot up to you as I've begun to really understand this. And you talked about the home study. Oh my the home study. The is my home, home adequate study. enough? Well, tell us a little bit more about home study. The home study is completed by your agency, Lutheran, Bayer, Buckner's, Children's Home. We're all here. So each one of us does a home study on you. And as required by the minimum standards, that's what's going to dictate the questions we ask you. So we will ask you individually questions, we'll ask you questions as a couple, we're going to ask you questions as a family, and then new minimum standards came out on Monday, which will even ask your neighbors questions. Yeah, are you a good neighbor? <laughs> mm. We may ask your school officials questions. Are you involved in your children's process at school? Are you, are you, um, uh, willing to go the extra mile to get their educational needs met. So this process takes several times to do, to come into your home and do, because we really want you to think about the questions. We don't want to rush it. We want you to give us an accurate picture. So we're going to ask you every question but your shoe size, and we may even ask that. Who knows? No. It is an in-depth uh, study, because we need to be able to assess who you are, how we can make a, put a child in your home that will fit with you. Not every child will fit. We need to know how to better uh, work with you, to train you maybe, or teach you how to do things. If you take a teen and you've never had a teen in your home, how do we need to work with you so that we can make everyone successful? We want you as a family successful, and we want the children to be successful. So that is a part of the home study, and it has to be completed and before you can be verified. You know, and switching gears a little bit to talk a little bit about those of us in the room who are really feeling a sense that we want to support. Um, you know, my first introduction to uh, the world of foster care and the reality of what's available and what's needed in our, in our city came through um, a group called the One Heart Group. And it's a group that one of the, that several of our churches have started and have sur sustained and it's growing. And that's where I actually met Keith. It's called One Heart and it's really the churches in unity around this cause. So I'd have you to know that you sit in the room with many people tonight, but there are many more at other churches in our town who've had similar meetings that some of you all have all participated in and seen what is happening. You know, the word of God says that, um, that when the brethren dwell together in unity, that it's there that God commands his blessing. And I believe God is commanding his blessing over his church because we're getting in unity around this very, very important matter. So I met Keith at one of those meetings and I learned a lot about the support side of things. So Keith, will you talk to us a little bit about respite care and babysitting and what maybe some families might be able to do to get involved in, in that way? Yeah, absolutely. And they actually asked me my shoe size in my home study, Glenna. No, <laughs> uh, so really, I'm going to take this. I'm a director of an agency, but I'm also a foster dad. And so when I look at it from that perspective of babysitting and respite care uh, and the integral piece that it plays, it's huge. Because when my wife and I decided we wanted to foster, we knew that was our calling. God was calling us to serve these kids. But it was really hard for us to extend that calling to our friends and family, right? And say, oh, well, you need to get licensed as a babysitter. You need to get licensed as a respite care provider. But it's such a need. We often see foster families that just burn out because they're in the trenches by themselves serving this kid. And they believe, well, I can't ask my friends to do this for me, you know, because there's so many hoops you got to jump through. So when we look at respite care, for most of the agencies on the stage and in this auditorium, you basically have to go through all the requirements of a foster family almost to be able to do respite care. We view respite care as anything that's over 72 hours, up to 14 days. So if you're going to take a kid into your home longer than three days, up to 14 days, there's a lot of requirements placed on that individual or that family to go through so that you can support that foster family that way. We view babysitting anything up to eight hours, 
short-term or relief care is using anything above eight hours up to 72 hours. For those, there's less requirements. But for all of those, um, I think every agency in this room would say, you have to have an FBI fingerprint, so you have to go and get fingerprinted. That's usually $42 a person, roughly, to do that. You have to be CPR first aid certified, so you gotta go and take the class, pay for the class, um, and so that's where the burden really comes on a foster family that, man, I'm not going to ask you go spend your money, give your time, so you do all these classes so that you can serve me. And I think that's an integral part the church can step up and say, you know what, if we're going to call our people to action, we're also going to put the support network around them. Because who better to serve a family in your church fostering than other families in your church who will say, we believe this is the gospel and we're going to rally around you. And so we're going to go get that babysitting class or maybe somebody in the church can do CPR first aid, they're, they're a certified trainer. Maybe they say, hey, we're gonna have a training class and it's gonna be free. We want any family in our church that's willing to do this to come to this class. So there's a number of ways that you can jump in, but ultimately, families that are really successful at fostering have a really incredible support system around them. They're able to take the date night. They're able to call their friends and say, hey, it's a rough week. Can this little guy come spend the weekend with you? Um, but for them to do that, you have to have all those requirements. Or as an agency, we have to look at our family and say, you can't place the kid there for the weekend. You, you have to keep the kid. Um, so respite care, a uh, lot more requirements on that, but it's very needed. If we could have a respite family wrapped around every foster family in Lubbock, that would be huge if they knew I have this family to serve me. If we could have a babysitter wrapped around every family in Lubbock who's fostering, that'd be huge. They'd have a support system around them that says, we got your back, we're gonna ride this wave with you, and we're gonna serve kids and create impact in these children's lives. That's awesome. Did I get some of y'all excited? I saw your faces. Excellent. Peggy, why don't you share a little bit with us about some of the other ways to get involved, a little bit about what CASA does. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much for allowing us to be here as well. And um, as you said before, you know, it's really important these kids have such a need and it's such a great thing to see and know that there are people out there that wanna help kids in so many different ways. Um, CASA is Court Appointed Special Advocates and we are a nonprofit volunteer organization and basically our mission is providing volunteers who serve as advocates for children that are in foster care. So our program, we don't have the kids in our homes. Um, and sometimes it's that way, you know, someone can't necessarily take their kids, the kids into their home, and, but they do want to help, and this is one, one way that they can offer that help. Um, this program was started back in 1977 in Seattle, Washington by a judge that was hearing these types of cases, these kids that were in foster care, and really felt like, you know, um, something else needed to be there, or something else to help, you know, these kids, kind of that wrap around. And so this program really has spread. Um, we've been here in Lubbock for, um, for a little over 20 years. And essentially what our program is all about is there are some requirements, just like with a lot of these, all these organizations that work with children, um, background checks, interview application references, things of that nature, and, and, a, and a, a training as well. Um, and then once a volunteer has gone through all that process and that volunteer is assigned to one of our cases, which is a family unit unit of kids. So if there's three kiddos that came into care in that one unit, that volunteer is assigned to those three kids. And essentially, we're appointed as the guardian ad litem. And it's guardian for court purposes. The kids are not in our homes. We're simply another set of eyes and ears in this child's life while they're in the system. And we just want to make sure that their needs are, are being met. Um, it's an overburdened system. There's a lot of kids that are in care. You know, there were more than uh, about 1,200 children in care in our area last year. Um, and that's just an, it's a big system, unfortunately. And so we're just another set of eyes and ears. We're appointed by the judge. So in essence, the judge is our boss and we let him know of everything that we know that's going on for these kids and just recommend things for them and, and just want to ensure that their needs are being met while they're in the system. Um, and one of the things that's really important for us is that our volunteers have that they are constant. You know, we do ask for a minimum commitment of at least 18 months. These kids are in care are typically in care at least you know, at that amount of time, if not longer. And we want to be able to give them, you know, somebody that can be stable and constant for them. Because unfortunately, a lot of times when kids are in care, they do get moved from place to place and have different people coming in and out of their lives. That's just, that's just unfortunately the system. It's not necessarily fault. That's just the system. Um, and so, you know, if we can give them somebody that can be a constant for them, that's going to be there, even if they get from one place to another. I'm still here. I know what's going on for you. I know what's been going on. I'm going to keep track of that. I'm going to keep following you. And it's about 10 to 15 hours a month to be a volunteer. There's a lot of flexibility to being a CASA volunteer. Um, the minimum requirements as far as age, you do have to be at least 21. 
Um, and like I said, there was an intensive training kind of up front, but after that, you can fit it in. The other thing is that I, I tend to forget to say, but it's also something important for you to know, is that you can partner up. You can do this with someone else. You can do this um, on your own, or you can do this with a spouse. You can do it with a friend, you know, whatever it might be. You can certainly do this together with someone else and, you know, wrap the kiddos around with some, some people in the community that say that I care about you, you know. And again, if it's just not something that you know, you can volunteer and you do want to foster. There is such a need for that, you know. So we get calls sometimes, I really want to foster. There's plenty of agencies. There is a need. Wherever you feel the, whatever feels best for you, that's where you want to be. And it's awesome that you're having this to help people know a little bit more about what there is out there. It's great. You know, as we got ready for this meeting, um, I visited with some of the churches I told you about earlier to ask, what were some of the questions, you know, your people were asking? And I've talked to some of you and, and gotten, the, I, you know, your questions over the last month as we stood around the table. And so we're going to talk about some of those here um, next. Keith, why don't you answer the question for us that gets asked, which is, do I have to adopt a child to foster them? No, um, absolutely, you don't. Uh, you, you can foster a child for an extended period of time without ever having to adopt that child. In fact, that's a huge need. Um, oftentimes I think families only think about the adoption side and they think, man, I don't want to take a kid into my home and just love them for a season and release them. Um, but as agencies, I can, I can say we all need that. We need families who are willing to risk their heart and their life and say, I'm going to serve this kid for a season without the possibility of ever adopting them. Um, and that's huge, man. That, that's, that's messy ministry, getting down in the trenches and saying, I'm going to live out this gospel. Um, and plant as many seeds as you can into their life. And so, yeah, you, you can totally foster a child without ever having to adopt them. Um, in fact, that's probably one of the largest needs we have is families who will say, I'm just willing to foster. If adoption happens, it can happen. My wife and I, we, we were wanting to foster sibling groups. That was our heart. So we took in a sibling group of four. Now we may end up adopting a sibling group of four, which was not the heart. <laughs> Parent of six forever. What were you doing, Jesus? But... Um, <laughs> Seriously, though, we need foster families. We need families to say, I'll serve a kid for one day. I'll serve a kid for 18 months without the goal ever being adoption and saying, I will pour Jesus into this child and I will love them and I will nurture them and I will take them to health um, without knowing the end result. God said, you know, don't worry about tomorrow. And so my wife and I's motto is, God put this kid in our home today. We love him today. Tomorrow is a different story. We'll see where it plays out. So That's powerful. Thank you. Um, Angela, why don't you share a little bit with us about the cost of foster care and adoption? Okay. Well, as far as foster care, there is not a, a cost to the families. Um, the state will provide monthly subsidy for each child. Um, there is no cost to the home studies for foster care. Um, what was the other thing I was going to say about foster care? Oh, the children are on Medicaid. And so that will cover their medical expenses and counseling um, expenses, uh, psychiatric services. Um, also, for younger children, they can uh, foster children are approved for WIC, so families can get formula to help with that expense. For adoption, um, I think most of us here are focusing on special needs children instead of infants. And so if a child is a a special need to qualify for that would be a child that's at least six years old, um, at least two years old and a member of a minority group or um, a sibling group or a child that has a verifiable physical, mental, or emotional handicapping condition that is established by a professional. And if a child meets one of those qualifications and a child is placed into your home for adoption before they're, they're 18 years of age, then the family will get uh, Medicaid coverage for those children. They will also uh, be able to negotiate for a monthly subsidy, depending on the needs of the child. Um, they will also um, get a one-time reimbursement of up to $1,200 per child to help with a, a fee of, say, uh, the attorney's fee. So really, there's nothing out of pocket for those families that are adopting special needs. Also, the children that um, qualify for this is uh, they, the kids can go to any state college in the state of Texas for free tuition. So as I hear you talk, I, um, I'm a, I come from a family where adoption is 
generations deep. Every generation of our family has adoption. And so my heart for this really was birthed out of the fact that I watched a nephew get caught up in CPS in the state of Colorado. And um, for three years as a family, we fought through that situation to try to find the best home for him. And, and the, you know, the state did what they needed to do, but we as the family stood by wanting to take custody of him. And so that really is, um, you know, a little bit of my story that I have, you know, just generations deep of adoption. My sister has three children. They're all adopted. My sister's adopted. My dad is adopted. <laughs> you know, I can just go on and on. Adoption is the core of my family. It's the core of my spiritual family. We're all, we've all been adopted into um, the beloved, into a relationship with God as you know, brothers and sisters in the Lord, and that's, that's just his heart, is adoption. And so, Glenna, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the difference between foster to adopt and a private adoption. So foster adopt is when you take a child, a foster child, into your home, and if their parental rights of their biological parents have been terminated, they are available for adoption at that point, or they may be in your home. Keith said his kids were coming in as foster kids and at some point their parental rights were terminated and they were available for adoption and he could not say no, right? <laughs> yeah, that's it. No nos, it. no nos. Yeah. <laughs> and so sometimes you have to wait for the courts to determine that the parental rights will be terminated. Normally we courts want the children to reach their permanency plan, whether it be go back home or be adopted, within a year. Sometimes they give them six months extensions. Sometimes it does take longer, but once their rights are terminated, then we consider them available for adoption. And doing that, you have to have the child in your home for six months before you can consummate that adoption. But guess what? You've already come to love them, right? You want them to be a permanent part of your home, and when you do that and go through the process of adoption, there is very minimal cost. I've not had, uh, we were talking about this recently with a couple of agencies, very little cost. Most of our attorneys will do it pro bono, so in terms of uh, the cost for, for foster to adopt. Now, one of uh, my coworkers worked for an adoption agency, and she said, the issue there is it costly. A lot of families, if you go with a private adoption agency, it can cost anywhere from 10000 and um, a lady told us recently up to $50,000 to adopt that child. Still the same thing. You have to have a home study. Normally, if you're getting a child straight from the mom, uh, uh, you can work a closed adoption, you can work an open adoption, and if it's straight from the hospital, then that child, you know, won't be placed in your home for a couple of days, and then you still have to have them six months before you consummate that adoption. But you still have to go through the paperwork and the home studies. And to become a foster family, you know, it's all the paperwork, it's all of the fun things that we require of you. It's trainings. Each agency has trainings you have to go through. But remember, this is about kids. This is about kids who've been hurt, wounded, and need a loving home, a home that they can feel safe in, they can find success, and be able to be our future. Erin, uh, will you share a little bit with us about the question that's been asked is, can I sp select a specific age or gender of a child? And I just generally, how is a child selected for my home? Um, yes, you can, um, each family can make their own preferences on the age of a child and the gender of a child. Um, we may ask you guys to consider ages that are a little older than you're comfortable with, possibly to keep sibling groups together. Um, and then how a child is selected from your home. Um, sometimes when you guys complete your home study, we'll interview you and ask what you guys are comfortable with. Um, if you feel like you're comfortable to work with a child who has um, disabilities or learning disabilities, we take that, take that into consideration. Uh, when we get requests from Child Protective Services, we read the information we're provided and then we match that information with our families. And then we'll go ahead and call our families and kind of discuss with our families the, the needs of the child and the behaviors, or if, there's, um, if it's a child with disabilities, what kind of disabilities they do have. So can a family say no? Yes. <laughs> a family has a, a right to say no. Um, there are times that some families may be overwhelmed in their own family life, and it's not time to take on a child who has severe problems. And it's not frowned upon if you guys do say no for a child. Very 
Yeah, thank you. Okay, Lenore, why don't you tell us a little about the children that we've seen in the Heart Gallery? I have to tell you, um, Tuesday was like the day for me. <laughs> it was so sad. I watched you all march in here and march out with the kids we had really grown to love. Our kids. Yeah, they became our kids. My only prayer is that maybe through the lives of some of you in our church that those children become a permanent part of our church family here at Trinity. Um, I didn't want to see them go. <laughs> and it was just really awesome to see the things that happened while we were here. So tell us a little bit about um, what somebody does if they've seen a child in the heart gallery that they're interested in. Uh, first of all, y'all did see a bunch of pictures out there. I still have plenty of more, um, Sally, but that does happen. I do carry a book with me. Um, it's not those big pictures that you see, but I do carry them with me. I also have them on the tables today. What happens is if you're interested in a child, specific child, basically they're on the TEAR website. Um, usually a lot of people, they give me a call. Once they give me a call, I, I can't discuss information about the child specifically, but what I do is I give their, your information to the adoption worker and the adoption supervisor. They're the only ones can discuss the, uh, about the child you know, about the child, uh, how he behaves, what he likes, what he likes to play. Also, we do, we have to review the home study before we can release any of that stuff. Um, and it's tons of paperwork with that, but sometimes it's an effort. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to do, actually do a video on the internet so you'll be able to see the child the way he interacts instead of just seeing a picture. They do come in siblings, they do come individually. Um, I mean, but one of the things that I do notice is I am the faith-based recruiter. I do go around churches. I do ask for them to at least pray for our kids. They're our kids. They're not just my kids. They're everybody's kids, everybody's problem. Um, and that's one of the things that you can do. You, I am in Plainview, Texas, but I do cover 41 counties. Uh, the Heart Gallery goes to every church, almost every church, um, businesses. If you would like for them to be at your business, you can also do that. But most likely, if you wanna, you're want you interested in a specific child, all you have to do is contact me, and I will contact the adoption worker and the adoption supervisor, and they can actually tell you what's going on with that child. For now, specific. you mentioned a website. I'm not familiar with that website. Can you tell us how to access that? Yes, we do have a website. Um, there's lots of ways you can access to it. You can go under www, Texas Department of Family and Protective Services. There's a link that's TEAR, Texas Adoption. Adoption. <laughs> that always gets me off. It's Texas Adoption, Adoption. Adoption. Resource Exchange. Exchange. Yeah. That's Sally, but I don't know it. I, we have so many acronyms in CPS, so that's why when I, I say CVS, CPS. I'm new, to, I'm new to this world, and I have been lost. I mean, the first time I met Keith, I said, stop, slow down, start over. You lost me already, you know? Yeah. I learned a lot. Thank all of you. That's one way. You also can go to the TARE, T-A-R-E, Dot org and basically it shows all the children are up for adoption also. So um, an individual can choose to go partnership through um, all of the agencies that are present and even some that are not here tonight or they can um, work with CPS to go through this process. Can Correct. you tell us a little bit about the difference between those two? Uh, right now since our my I call them my co-workers but there's different agencies basically we do have the same thing minimum standards we have to follow minimum standards we also have to follow uh, home studies uh, FBI's the difference is we only take basic care for our children for CPS only the other agencies I understand they take moderate care um, also there's another agency that does voluntary placement um, you know, so basically we do the same thing, but it's just the level of care. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right, um, Mike, I, I wanted you to share a little bit. I, I met Mike. Mike's previously been a house parent at the Texas Boys Ranch, or yeah, Texas Boys Ranch. I got that right. And um, at that time, he was bringing his boys to church here at Trinity and has some pretty cool church stories to tell us about, which blessed me, so thank you for sharing those. But more importantly, um, Mike just shared a little bit with me about what expectations a foster parent should come into this process with, and from a real spiritual standpoint. So I've asked Mike to share a little bit of that with us. Well, I really do appreciate uh, Trinity opening, being re receptive to the Holy Spirit and opening your doors so that we could come and, and share about this incredible need. And it takes all of us to meet the need. There's so many children that need good homes. And uh, I, my, my experience is kind of like Keith in that I, I really didn't choose this field, it just kind of chose me. And it started out about 19 years ago when my wife and I decided to adopt a little girl from Korea. 
And uh, we, we took that step. My wife is typical. The wife, she led the way, and I was like, I don't know about this. <laughs> and I was praying one day, and she, she told me finally. I kept putting her off, and she said, um, are you, are you, uh, are, are you, are you going to pray about this? And I was like, okay, I guess, I, I guess I will. So at the time, I was a youth pastor. So I was a youth pastor for 14 years. And, you know, I went to the church office, and I remember it was 5 o'clock, and I was going home. I was getting ready to go out the door, and I was like, oh, I told my wife I'd pray. And so I shut the door and I knelt down in my office and I asked the Lord. I started to, you know, started, I had all this, what I was going to say. And I mean, the Lord cut me off. And he said, why wouldn't it be my will for you to take a homeless child into your home? Scared me to death. Okay. I was a Baptist, I was in a Baptist context at that point And it just totally just, I was scared. I called her up. I said, yes, now. And so we went home and God literally just did a miracle and we got that little girl home. She looks Korean but she talks with a Texas draw and now she's 19. She graduated from high school and she is such a blessing to our life. Well that's where it all started. And then as a youth pastor we took a young man into our home and he was a teenager 14 years old and we didn't know what we were getting into. We were trying to do a good deed and we took him into our home and we almost, I mean we almost lost our family. It was so, such chronic changes and a big part of that was me. And so we came through that, and God gave us a great victory, and we were able to keep him. And now he's married and, and doing successful, and he's been in youth ministry, his brother. So all this just kind of happened for us. And then after we left uh, that context that we were in, we found some answers. God did a big work in my life, and we went to a non-denominational context. And then we're on staff at another church, and things went really well until about a year later. And then it was like things weren't going so well. And the only thing that opened up for us, we were praying for a ministry and we became house parents of the Texas Boys Ranch. And that was very formative as everything else that we'd gone through. And, uh, you know, at the time we were told we had the eight most disturbed kids in Lubbock County. <laughs> uh, it was incredible. And we brought kids here and we've got lots of stories. I could go all day with those. But, you know, from kids blooding noses on Easter morning of other kids in church. I mean, we, we've, we've seen a lot. And, and we've seen God do so much. But, you know, this is a high calling. And if you think that you're going to make a difference or with God's help that you're going to make an impact in a child's life without it costing you something, I'm sorry, but your, your awareness is going to, going to change as you step into this process. Because it's, it's a very redemptive act. Foster care and adoption is about redemption. It's about reaching out to these children that have been abused, that have been neglected, that have been hurt. And here's, here's, you know, here's a motto, hurt people, hurt other people. And when you get these kids and they come into your home, you may have expectations way up here. My strong advice to you is that you lower those expectations and you give those to God and you ask him to change your expectations and form in you what he wants to do because this isn't just about the kids. It's about what God is doing in you. And I don't have a foster parent come through our training or through our classes without knowing God is doing something very significant in their lives because you will be forever changed. You know, this system is broken. And I think all of us would agree this system is broken. And if you go into this with your eyes on the system, you're going to be dis you're going to become unhappy. You're going to become disenchanted. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Because when your eyes are on him, he'll take care of the other things. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But this may be one of the most challenging things that you've ever done in your life. And you know, when Jesus died on the cross for my sins and for your sins, that was a messy deal. Like Keith was talking about, that, that, was, a, that was a bloody mess. And it doesn't mean that you're going to have a real bloody mess when you take these kids in. But you need to be prepared that God is calling you to go to the front lines and redeem children from the hands of the enemy. And you have to understand that with that, there's a cost that's involved. And so you need to really give those expectations to the Lord about what it's going to be like. My wife and I are foster parents right now. We, we took a little girl in. She was placed with us as an infant at birth. We, we didn't know we were going to be adopting her. But we wound up fighting in court for her for two years. You know, God was leading us to do that. I'll tell my parents. I won't blink away from it. God may call you to file an intervention in court if you don't agree with what's taking place. But oh my goodness, the blessing that's come to us. We've adopted that little girl. She's four years old. I, I can't even begin to express the way that she has impacted our life. And God has been so faithful through all the challenges. Uh, and sometimes the things we pray for come to us in a package we don't want. And so you have to be aware of that and understand, okay, God, you're calling me in this. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to keep my eyes on you. And if you'll give me wisdom and if you'll give me 
leadership, I will follow you in this and I will work with this broken system and I will see you help these children in ways that maybe I don't even understand. And so whether you're called to foster or adopt or both, just understand that this is, this is something that God is calling you to do. You have to understand with that, there, there's a responsibility. And it can turn out to be the biggest blessing that you've ever experienced. I am so grateful for all of the experiences that we've had, the tough ones, the not so tough ones, because it has directly impacted us and, and made us more kingdom minded when we're trying to help these children and try to reach out to them. And I mean, everybody that's up here and all the agencies in town, everybody has a heart to help these children. And we are so thankful to have families like you who are interested to at least look into this and see where God might be leading you. Because if, if he is, just get ready. It's going to be a ride. I'm just <laughs> telling you. I tell people it's like getting on a roller coaster with a blindfold on. You don't know. You don't know where it's going to go or where God's going to take you. And you may not know all of his purposes in this. But if you'll keep your eyes on him, he'll guide you through it. And you'll, you'll turn out with a bigger blessing than you ever imagined. People tell us, you know, you've adopted, well, you, wow, y'all are such a blessing in a child's life. They have no idea that she's the blessing to us. That little girl we've adopted and my other daughter we've adopted, they're the, we're the ones that get blessed because we took them in. And nobody understands that except for people who have adopted. And they can look at their children and say, oh, my gosh, thank you, God, that you've given us the privilege to do this. And I just, uh, man, thank you. I, I could go on and on. Thank you, Mike. But we thank just thank you for being allowed yeah. us to come. Thank you, Mike. I really think that that spoke to, to many of us. Um, thank you. Um, I want to introduce a couple of families in our church that are with us tonight that have actually um, been foster parents and some that are fostering to adopt. So if you guys would stand. This is uh, Chris and Candy Dawson here in the striped shirt and pink. And then back over here we have Stephen and Rhonda Cox. You guys don't have a microphone. If you want to say something, you have to run up here to grab one so it's being recorded. But is there anything you'd like to, to just share with our families? How is everybody? A couple things. First of all, here's, here's something that I personally found pretty confusing. Special needs. And I know we just define special needs. This is what was interesting to me. Any child in this system that's over two, year, two years old, right? In his minority, yeah. special needs. Yeah. Or what's the other one? If they're Caucasian and over six, then they're special needs. Or if they're in the system with multiple siblings, by definition, right, they're special needs. Yeah. So that kind of was, I, I struggled with understanding that concept at first. And so, you know, uh, we need a special needs child. Are we equipped to do that? No. By definition, they're basically all special needs at some <laughs> level, right? Um, the other thing uh, I wanted to share, uh, you know, and... Um, I am extremely encouraged by the fact that we are having this conversation and that as churches we're having this conversation. Um, on the other hand, I'm extremely discouraged when I sit here and I look at how many people are here tonight and how many people sit in this church every single weekend. And so I, for me, the message is, man, we've got to really get this message out. I mean, there, and, and our experience was very much, Keith, right? Mike, Mike. Mike sorry, sorry guys. <laughs> Very much like Mike's experience, maybe it's typical. Um, I was the anchor holding us back. Ron has talked for years about foster and adoption, and I said, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and, and I had that exact same moment. For me, the question was, why not? The Holy Spirit said, why not? You know, as a church body, why would we not do this? I mean, is there anything that's more explicit than the command to love these children? No. So... Um, and I don't know how much time or what you want us to share. We, I'm, I'm a, how many? Okay, so we, I've, I've got three girls, um, and I, all I knew was girls. And um, uh, my oldest is uh, 18, youngest is in uh, fifth grade, and now we've got Zaylin, who is four. I completely forgot what a four-year-old was like, but um, I had no idea what a boy was like. And so it's been a life-changing experience for us, and I can just tell you, man, he is, he is a, a joy, and every day is a new experience, and it's been a ride, and it's been a blessing. Um, uh, I can tell you that, and, and we worked with Bear Foundation, but I can tell you with any of these other agencies, here's the blessing. Um, and, and we talked about the system. The system is broke. Let me tell you why. I'm sorry, I don't remember your name. Lenore. 
How many counties did you say you covered? 41 counties. 41 counties. So she's going to do this for 41 counties. You can already tell. Dude, that's impossible. The experience that we had in working with an agency was that when we got frustrated with um, the process or didn't understand the process, the agency came alongside us and said, hey, we're going to help you walk through this process. And so that was a huge blessing in our life. Um, can't speak highly enough about what these people do. So I'm going to uh, be quiet now. Thank you, Stephen. You I betcha. appreciate you. Wouldn't expect anything less. Get on the microphone, girlfriend. <laughs> um, if you, maybe right now, foster doc freaks you out, come talk to us because it's really not a, I mean, it is a lot of paperwork, but if I can do it, you can do it. Um, but CASA, we, one of our CASA worker is Maria. And let me tell you, our little Zalen, if Maria's coming, he is running to the door, Miss Maria, you know, he's climbing all over Maria. And I mean, and she's not young, she's a grandmother. Um, but she, lo I mean, she comes in and gives him a hug and loves on him and thinks he's the greatest thing next to sliced bread. And so the deal is, is no matter what role you play, there's a role to be played. And every one of them is of great importance in these children's lives. Um, and so I would just encourage you to pray because God's got a role for you. Um, you may or may not like that at this point, but um, he has a role for you. And maybe your spouse has been dragging you along the way. Just give in and just do it. <laughs> just give in and go with it because um, you cannot imagine the blessing. And it may be a hard journey. Ours has not been, so I can't even speak to that. Um, ours has, he is just like my second daughter, a clone. Um, I could have birthed him, um, except he's African American. Outside of that, he <laughs> is just like her. I mean, but it is precious to watch tonight. We're sitting at the table, and he doesn't like green beans, and so we start doing a little rap dance. To, and he is, he's about to fall out of the cherry, chewing on his green beans. And so he just thought that was hilarious. So I just want you to know what an experience. God will increase your territory. God will expand your heart to be able to do whatever he's calling you to do at this time. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, Candy and Chris are here also, so if you guys would like to visit with them, they'll share their experiences with you as well. You guys don't currently have any children in your home. Uh, they're expecting their own biological third, and they just had two babies who are in a transition. So we pray for them regularly, knowing that God's plan is for family, and those kids, God has a plan for their lives too. They're sweet little people. All right, well, um, the last thing I want to wrap up with is just really for Keith, will you wrap us up with the answer to this question? Okay, so what's my next step? today yeah absolutely so all these wonderful agencies are here and, and Trinity has been so gracious to invite us in so I think really your next step is to go and talk to some of these agencies begin to hear their heart see how they align with your heart and, and figure out what agency would work best for you begin to ask the questions that you have uh, there's so many questions in this process and I think I can speak for everyone we want your questions we don't want you to feel like well I don't want to ask one more question I don't want to send one more email I don't want to call one more time and annoy them we want you to do that because this is a confusing process. And our role, as you, you said so brilliantly, is to walk beside you and to say, all right, you may not understand this or this may frustrate you. Let us walk beside you. So we'll be out there um, afterwards where you can talk to us and you can ask those questions. And, and I would just encourage you to do something. I think we often pray. We say, you know, does Jesus want us to do this? I don't think that's the prayer. The prayer is, what do you want me to do? We already know Jesus wants us to do something. We can look at Scripture and we can't deny that he wants us to do something. Um, and so then we just have to figure out, what is it you want us to do? How do I fo follow you? Because we read scripture, and, and he's the father of the fatherless. He's the defender of widows and orphans. And if we are his adopted kids, we've taken on his DNA. Um, and so if our father is the father of the fatherless, what does that make us as his kids? And, and so the real, real prayer is, what do you want me to do? How do I live this gospel out in my life? Because there's a thousand kids panhandle wide who need you to ask that question and need you to pray that prayer. Um, and first step, start talking to the agencies, figuring out how do I fit into this, this big mosaic, incredible masterpiece that God's painting of churches and families and kids coming together and him redeeming those families and redeeming those children because um, there's tons of ways to plug in. So we'll be out there. Love for you to come by and talk to us. Uh, first step is you came here or you watched this video. Second step, come talk to us. Let's start the journey of questions and answers. Let me go ahead and close this in a word of prayer, and I do want to encourage you guys to follow up on Keith's action there, just to step outside. The tables are all out there. We want you to take that step. And for those of you who are in the room who've spoken to me and you're interested in, in supporting our family, stay in the room for just a few more minutes. I have a few things I want to share directly with you all. And uh, let me close it in a word of prayer.
Father, we thank you, Lord, for today. And Father, we thank you that this is a day that you truly have made and that we can rejoice in every way and be glad in it. God, I thank you that there are big things happening, shaking in each of our hearts. And Lord, just as Keith reminded us, Lord, that we're not asking if we should, but what we should. Lord, show us what we're supposed to do, each one of us, that each one of us will set in motion some change that will cause the, the impact on lives for for now and for the future and, and for eternity, God, that these kids would know you and that they would arrive in heaven, that they would have salvation, Lord God, and that they would live abundant lives even though the enemy has intended to destroy and to take away from them. God, we thank you for those workers in the agencies and organizations. I pray tonight that you would lift their arms, that you would cause the schedules that they keep, the um, duties that they have, the overwhelming tasks that they've shouldered to be made lighter, Lord, by the prayers of your church lifting and supporting them. Them in Jesus' name, amen. 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 Bless y'all.